Welcome back. We're going to start today by looking at lifting machines. Right now, a lifting machine is one of the simplest devices in engineering, and its simple task is that of amplifying or increasing a force. So, in other words, a human operator, for example, applies a small force to a machine, and in turn, that force is made bigger to do some other activity. Now the simplest machine we can think of is probably one that looks a little bit like this. If you can picture you're in the field and you need to move a heavy rock, which I've drawn here in green, and you find a wooden pole, a nice long wooden pole, and you rest it on another rock, which is essentially a pivot, and this distance from here to here is greater than from here to here, you will effectively have built yourself a lifting machine because when you push down here, your relatively small force applied to the end of the pole will be amplified because of the lengths I mentioned moments ago and you will lift a rock much heavier than you could lift just with your normal bare hands. Now, as we know, there is no free lunch as they say. So what disadvantage is there to increasing this force? If we take a small force and we make it into a big force, that sounds too good to be true. And indeed that is the case, because with this increased force comes the downside, and that is the fact that the force or the side with the high force is going to move very slowly. Okay, so if we draw the device we spoke of moments ago with that pull, this distance being shorter than this distance, yes, we will achieve a large force between the load and the pole, larger force than the effort we applied. And that's great, but the downside is this point will move more slowly than the input side. And in turn, in a period of time, would move less distance. So yes, we're able to amplify force, but the downside is we get reduced velocity of movement at the output side. And that is simply because what you put in is what you get out. And we'll discuss that a little bit later when we deal with the work involved in these machines. Right, now we get to the matter of arrowheads. And we may as well sort this out once and for all at this early point in your studies. And that is how to use double arrowheads. Okay, now. Often when you, when the layman draws a diagram where forces are involved, you will see just a single arrow, which is all good and well, but in reality it's not the full story. Now the full story, if you go and look at Newton's laws, and I'll tell you now that in your textbook that's on page 172, you know, the three laws of Newton are stated there, and one of them is that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, and that's why if we are to be strictly correct whenever we apply forces to an object, we should always have two arrowheads. Okay, so what I mean by that is, if this was the device we mentioned earlier, and we, the human operator, are applying the small force, which we call the effort, to the device, and we are pushing the device downwards. The device, which is the green pole, is feeling downward push. But the hand, your hand, that is pushing the device is, believe it or not, feeling an equal and opposite pushback. Okay, and that arrowhead is what your hand feels. Now think about it, if you're pushing the pole downwards, yes, the pole would probably move downwards and hence feel a downward effect or force, but your hand is feeling the pushback, which is upwards. So we always put the two together. And that pair over there is called the compression double arrowhead pair. And it works exactly like I explained. Two arrowheads away from each other. The one closest to the object indicates what that object feels. The pole feels down. The operator feels up. And if we go to the other side, remember that we have a, a rock or something placed on this side of the pole. And similarly, if we go to this drawing, between the orange rock and the green pole, 
there is a squeezing effect, a compression effect, which once again is the double arrowheads. The pole feels the down and the load feels the up and hopefully rises when we operate the machine. That's why we did it in the first place. And finally, here at the fulcrum or the pivot, same thing, we have the pole resting on something over here and there is once again compression. So it's once again the compression arrowhead pair, which is two arrowheads apart from each other. While we're on the matter of double arrowheads, these three were all compression. When we get to tension arrowheads, you'll notice that the two arrowheads face towards each other. We'll do that fairly soon, but I want you to remember the issue of double arrowheads. We will come back to it, but you need to master that very soon in this course. Now here are two other types of lifting device. The first being this winch over here where you rotate a handle quite quickly and this cable moves quite slowly. And in so doing, a small effort applied to the handle in a turning motion ends up as being a large force, albeit slow moving, on this hook. And the hook is able to pull something along. We can take it a step further and use a winch similar to that and build a jib crane, which would be something like this. Seen from the side, we have a pole, we have a pivot, and we have a strut, which supports the jib. But then underneath that, we've got the winch, exactly like the one over here, with a cable passing around a pulley, and we down to a similar looking hook, and we've effectively built a crane. So that would be a jib crane, which also would have a relatively small input force or effort, and would be able to lift a large or heavy load. Now, when we start making calculations to do with lifting machines, we need to work out a few few things and the first is this ratio of load over effort which is better known as mechanical advantage okay so if we go back to any of those devices we input a certain effort in this case on the handle in the case of the pole we applied it to the end of the pole but either way that smaller of the two forces was called effort and the larger one was on the load side that is the bigger number now the ratio of those two is called mechanical advantage. And if you put the larger over the smaller, you'll get a number, which by the way is unitless because it's Newtons over Newtons. So it cancels out and it just becomes a number. In other words, a unitless ratio. So mechanical advantage is load over effort that you've got to memorize. Next up is to look at the velocities. Okay, and we discussed a short while ago that there was no free lunch and the reason we said that was that the load moved very slowly or very small distance in relation to the effort which moved very quickly and maybe a much bigger distance okay so there's clearly a difference in the velocities or the distances moved by the load side and the effort side and once again if you place those in a formula as a ratio and you look at for instance distance moved by the effort over distance moved by the load, you would end up with a ratio. We call that velocity ratio. Okay, and you could also look at the speed of the effort over the speed of the load and you would get the very same ratio. And the reason for that is because time is common to both. Distance and speed are connected via a certain time period. So you can use either. And once again, we have a unitless ratio. Now in the perfect world, where all machines were 100% efficient, VR would be equal to MA. But unfortunately for us, there is friction in machinery such as these. You can well imagine that in any of those devices, there would be friction. Okay, in the lubrication of the various parts, which would not be perfect, there would be friction in bearings, there would be friction of the pole on the rock, it, each one of those machines would have some amount of friction. And that is why we can actually then work out the efficiency of the machine by putting the lesser number over the bigger number. And we get a number between 0 and 1, which we call efficiency. So in other words, if the mechanical advantage that you measured for a particular machine was 5, 
and the velocity ratio was 10, you would have an efficiency of 0.5, which we can multiply by 100 and call simply 50%. So let's recap. Velocity ratio is based on distance moved by effort, distance moved by load, and that would be related to the geometry of the machine. You would actually measure the length of the pole on each side of the fulcrum, or you would work out the gear ratio of the device. Whatever it takes to work out the actual distance moved by the effort or the distance moved by the load. Or you could look at speeds and you would have a number that does not change. However, in contrast to that, mechanical advantage would be measured actual forces that the machine achieved. And those would vary as friction varied. If the machine was well lubricated on Monday, you might find that the mechanical advantage was better than by Wednesday when the oil had worked out of the machine and it was not as well lubricated. So MA is variable and based on two measured numbers, forces, whereas velocity ratio is fixed to the geometry of the machine. Now we get to the matter of graphs. Okay, now it's very important in your early engineering studies to understand that graphs in engineering are not just pretty pictures as they might be in other fields. Here in engineering a graph is more often than not used as a tool for calculating something. Okay and we're going to explain that as we go through this very first graph that we're going to draw. And this graph is that of effort plotted against load for a machine. In this case they're both in units of newtons and let's say we did an experiment on a lifting machine, any of those that we've worked on so far, those examples, and we lifted a bunch of different loads, heavier and heavier and heavier, and we noted for each one what effort was required. So we took our clipboard and we wrote down that for load of whatever that was, we required effort of whatever that was. And then we did another test with a heavier load, this much, and we measured it needed that much effort. And we had one, two, three, four, five, six data points. And we took a piece of graph paper and we very carefully drew this graph. And because of experimental scatter, we would draw as best we can. And we would then refer to these notes, which suggest that this is going to be a straight line graph, more of that later. But we would do a best fit between those experimental points, which obviously are not perfect because they're based on an experiment. And we would draw using a best fit this green straight line graph. Okay, and that would be called the load effort graph of the machine. Now, provided you know the slope value and you know the y-intercept value, you have the law of the machine because the law of the machine is exactly effort equals slope number times load plus y-intercept number. So if you know that and you know that and you lay it out in this format, you have what is known as the law of the machine. How does that help you? Well, once you have the law of the machine and you know, for example, what your load is going to be, you can immediately work out what the effort required will be. And vice versa, you could work out effort if you knew load and load if you knew effort, as long as you know the slope value and the y-intercept value. Right, how do we find the first of those, namely slope? Well, once again, cast your minds back to maths at school. You take any two data points. In this case, I've chosen the second one and the second last one, but it could have been any two. And I look at the change in vertical between those two points and I look at the change in horizontal between those two points. Put one over the other, change in vertical over change in horizontal and I will have slope. Okay and that number would represent how much this green line is sloping. The steeper it is, the bigger the number. The flatter it is, the smaller the number. The y-intercept is even easier to find. You simply read it off the graph and see where did the green line intercept the vertical axis. And that, by the way, is known or is the amount of force required to operate the unloaded machine. 
So that would be the pure friction that's involved in the machine once or when there's even no load on the machine. So if you want to just turn the winch, for example, without any load attached, it would already take a little bit of force, a little bit of effort, and that would be this value, which is also the y-intercept. Now the other graph that we're going to look at is the efficiency graph. Remember what efficiency was? Let's go back a few pages. Efficiency was mechanical advantage. Remember that was the variable number that you got from the actual experiment on the machine over the velocity ratio, which is the one that couldn't change. That was based on the sizes and geometry of the machine. And you got a number, 0.5 meaning 50%, 0.6 meaning 60%, etc. Now, if you go and you work out the efficiencies at various loads, you would have a data set that you could then plot a graph of. And your graph is likely to look something like this. As the load increased, so the efficiency changed, and it will start at the origin because when the load was zero, no matter how you calculate it, you will always end up with an efficiency of zero. So this graph, unlike the previous one, this one starts at the origin. And then as you plot your different efficiencies at your various loads, you are going to find that it's not a straight line, it's in fact a curve. And then amazingly, at some point, it starts to dip down again and the efficiency starts to reduce. And that brings us to the point of maximum efficiency, which clearly would be the highest point of the graph. And if in your design of your device, you are able to operate it around this area, you will get the best return on, let's call it investment on your machine, because you'll get the most out of your machine for the least in, which is always a good place to run a machine at. Now, the first thing one needs to normally work out on a lifting machine is the velocity ratio. And as we said earlier, that is based on the geometry of the machine, the proportions, the gear ratios, the length of the handles, whatever. It's, it's changes with changes in the actual shape and size of the machine. But once it is defined, it stays with the machine. Now in our first example, we have the simplest of lifting jacks, like you'd find maybe an automotive jack for lifting a vehicle. And it's based on a screw thread. Okay, so the way the screw thread works is it's like the thread on a bolt. If I'm sure you've held a bolt in your hand. And if you look closely at a bolt, it has thread, which in the case of a bolt has sharp crests. Okay, and if you were to measure the distance from the one crest to the next crest, that distance there, that would be called the pitch. In the case of the jack over here, it has what's known as a power thread, which has a more square profile, but the same principle is at play, and that is the fact that the pitch is the distance from a point on one thread to the very same point on the next thread. And the significance of that is, if you turn this jack by one full turn, if you grab hold of this handle over here, and you pull it towards you out of the page, and you go all the way around, in on this side and back out the page and you've turned one full turn this thread will have advanced one full pitch into or out of the base into which it threads okay so in our case that is resting on the ground and you would have to push this handle into the page to make this thread which is a normal right hand thread rise by one pitch and thereby lift the load by the distance equivalent to one pitch. Now remember what velocity ratio is. Velocity ratio is the distance moved by the effort compared to the distance moved by the load in one event. So let's consider the event to be one revolution of the handle. How far does the effort move? Well, your hand is on the end of the lever and it does one full circumference around a large circle back to the same point where it started. And the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, so it'll be 2 pi times whatever the radius is. And at the same time, the load rows by one pitch. So provided you know the radius and you know the pitch, 
you can get a number, a unitless ratio, which represents the velocity ratio of this particular jack. And you can just as well write it on the jack because it lives with that jack on good days when it's well lubricated and on bad days when it's not. For the rest of the life of that jack, that velocity ratio stays with it. The mechanical advantage might well vary day to day, but the velocity ratio will not. Next up is this device called a block and tackle. Now I would suggest you go and have a look at these three links over here. You'll find links that you can click on in your notes. And do that first before you look at the device itself because it will help you understand how it works. However, I'm going to try and describe it right now. And to do so, we need to understand that there are four pulleys or sheaves in this particular block and tackle. They can obviously vary. You can get some with more and some with less. But in this case, there are four. The blocks are essentially these two plates. There's a plate in the foreground and one behind that you can't see. And there's a pin through on which the pulley or the sheave is able to rotate freely. And then the tackle is the rope that you feed into the system. Now in this case the rope is attached to the top block, goes around this pulley, around that pulley, around the big pulley, around the top big pulley and out to the operator. Okay now this particular one is said to have four falls. You can count them one, two, three, four. This is not a fall, this is an external rope on its way to the operator and that can be at any angle, it has no effect on the device. Now let's understand what happens when we operate this, de this device. Let's put the operator right here and he is going to pull this rope and the rope is going to pass him and let's let that rope pile up on the floor behind him because as he pulls hand over hand he's extracting rope from the system and it's lying on the floor. Now let's consider this weight here rising from this level to that level. Let's make it a meter away. Okay, so one meter. If the load rises from here to here, namely one meter, each of these ropes, one, two, three, four of them, each had to also get a meter shorter because this whole bottom block, pulleys, load, everything rose up by a meter for this to happen. So if one meter there, one meter there, one meter there, one meter there of rope has been taken out of the system, where did the rope go to? Well, there's four meters of, of rope now lying on the floor behind the operator. And this lot got one meter shorter. So the final question is, how much rope did the operator pull past himself? In other words, how far did the effort move? Remember, he's applying the effort. Well, the answer is four meters. Okay, so if we have four meters of movement of the effort, for one meter movement of the load, what is the velocity ratio? It's equal to the number of falls. Okay, so it's a simple matter in a block and tackle of counting the falls. Make sure not to count the external rope, this one over here, just count the falls. And that number is equal to the velocity ratio of the machine. Now the last one we're going to look at before we get on to doing some problems is this one called the wheel and differential axle. This is a particularly interesting device, not something you'd see every day, but nevertheless interesting to understand and study. Now the way it works is we have two drums onto which rope is wound. So this is a circular drum of diameter D1, this is a circular drum of diameter D2. Now it's important to note how the ropes are wound onto the drums. The way this is drawn indicates that the rope is on our side of the drum. Whereas over here, the way this is drawn, it indicates that the rope is on the rear side of the drum. Okay, now it's important also to understand that this diameter is different to that diameter. And if you were to stand on this side here, looking at the device, and you were to turn it clockwise, you would wind rope up onto this drum, and you would wind rope out from this drum. But because this is bigger, and each turn is a bigger circumference of rope wound up than this one, it means you are ultimately winding up more rope than you are letting out. So the load would rise. So if we consider one revolution, so we're standing on this side and we're turning the device clockwise, winding rope up on this drum, winding rope out on this drum. 
we know that this load is going to rise. How much does it rise by when we turn one revolution? Well, let's look at the distance turned by the effort. And in this case, the effort is applied on the outside of yet another drum, this one with diameter D, by means of a rope wound around it. So the operator is pulling down on a rope that is wound onto this drum. So in one turn, pi times D is the circumference of this drum, hence the amount of rope that is passing through his hands. That is how far the effort moves. But then the more difficult one to understand is how much does the load rise by? What is the distance moved by the load? Well, pi D1 is the amount of rope wound up. And we must subtract from it pi D2 because that is the amount of rope let out, which is effectively lowering the load. But where does this come from? That's the question. Okay, and that is because of the two falls. If we go back to the previous example, we noted that when we had two falls, or four falls in that case, we further increased the velocity ratio. Okay, so that is why you divide by a half, which is the same as multiplying by two, and you further increase the velocity ratio. You, in fact, double it by having this effect of the two falls. Twice as much rope must be removed per unit length movement of the actual weight. So we end up with 2D over D1 minus D2 because obviously the pi's cancel out. And that ends up being the velocity ratio of the wheel and differential axle. Now for our first real example, and it's based on some sort of experiment they did, it says a winch is used to lift loads. Effort is applied to the winch by means of a handle having a radius of 400 millimeters. Okay, so the operator is going to apply the effort and he's turning a handle that has a radius of 400 millimeters. It is found that six complete turns of the handle cause the load to rise 0.7 meters. So it looks like we're going to have distance moved by effort once we bring circumference into this and load moves 0.7 meters. Then they also tell us that tests on the winch gave the following results and they have load versus effort values. Okay, and your first job is to draw the effort load graph. Well, that should be very simple because you're just going to take those values and draw them on a graph. Next, you've got to draw the efficiency load graph. And remember, you work out efficiency using a formula. You can go back in the notes to see that. And then from the graphs, you're going to determine the law of the machine. Remember, that was the straight line graph, y equals mx plus c, modified for our use here. And then finally, you must determine the effort required to lift a load of 10.9 kilonewtons, which incidentally is off the scale here. So you can either extrapolate from your graph or you could use the law of the machine to get this answer here. So stop the video now and make an attempt at that before looking at the solution. So now for the solution. First is the load effort graph. And there are your data points plotted on a graph of effort versus load. And as can be expected, best fit between those data points appears to give us a straight line. Remember the significance of the straight line is the y-intercept. You need that for the law of the machine. And the slope you're going to have to find. But we'll do that in a moment. Let's finish the question that was asked. It was to draw the other graph, namely the efficiency load graph. Now, to work that out, you're going to need to find the efficiency at the various points. That's over here. And efficiency, as we know, is mechanical advantage over velocity ratio. Okay, and mechanical advantage is load over effort. So you need to generate a table with all the values that you were given Plus, you're going to have to have two new rows that you add. First being mechanical advantage, which, as I just said, is load over effort. So for each set of data points, you take the load divided by the effort, you get an answer. Load over effort, get an answer, and so on. And remember, mechanical advantage is the one that varies at different load points of a machine. The velocity ratio is the one that stays the same. What is the velocity ratio of this machine? Well, they speak of distance moved by effort versus distance moved by load in the question. 
and let's just have a look they spoke of six complete turns of the handle remembering it has a radius of 400 millimeters and that caused the load to rise 0.7 meters so load moves 0.7 that's easy six turns of the handle each turn being 2 pi r distance traveled by the hand of the operator so in other words the effort moved that far during the six turns the load moved that far during the six turns that over that comes to 21.542 and that is your velocity ratio now effort correction efficiency is ma over vr that one stays the same that one varies so take each ma and divide it by the vr get an answer 0 0.357 0 0.516 etc here it's expressed as percentage you simply multiply by 100 to get efficiencies in percentages there they are finally you can plot those numbers against load bearing in mind that an efficiency curve starts at zero because as we said there is no um, work done at the beginning because we have um, zero mechanical advantage at the beginning because we have zero load right at the beginning that's at this point so that's why we start at the origin okay and then we soon go up to 35.7 percent 51.6 etc and we find that it is a curved graph starting at the origin and the graph will look something like that next up is the slope and the y-intercept both of which we need to express the um, law of the machine so first is the slope remember any two data points will give you the slope I've chosen to work with 330 and 230 for no particular reason but I'm going to use those two so the change in vertical over the change in horizontal will be 330 minus 230 from there to there and at the same time the load changed from 5000 to 3000 so we end up with a number 0 0.05 which is the slope of the straight line graph y-intercept is next so you need to look on your well-drawn accurate graph and find that point as best you can mine appeared to be about 80 newtons perhaps yours is more accurate and now you can express the law of the machine because it is simply effort equals slope times load plus y-intercept and that there is the law of the machine the very last thing to do was to work out the effort required at 10.9 kilonewtons load and as we said earlier that is off of this graph so you can simply use the law of the machine plug in the load of 10.9 kilonewtons multiply it by the slope which is part of the law add to it the 80 which is also part of the law and you get an answer for effort of 625 newtons next up we look at a device that involves gears now gears we're actually going to do in the next section of work but for now let's just understand the basics of gear ratio and here we have two meshing gears depicted a small gear meshing with a larger gear over here now it follows that one is going to turn faster than the other and it's also obvious if you look at the drawing that they are uh, that they are rotating in opposite directions so if this one is rotating clockwise this one will rotate anti-clockwise it stands to reason because the teeth are meshing and are moving downwards there where they contact with each other okay the smaller one will turn faster than the bigger one and the ratio of speeds between the two will be related to the number of teeth on the two gears so if we give the speed of the gears as capital n which is the variable we often use for speed given in revs per minute so the speed in revs per minute of gear a would be equal to the speed in revs per minute of gear b the the slower one remember multiplied by a ratio of teeth now let's think how to do that we need to make a bigger than b so we must multiply by a ratio that is bigger than one so if we take the teeth on b over the teeth on a we will have a number larger than one 
because clearly B has more teeth on it than A, you would have to count the number of teeth and insert the two values over there and over there. But you would then be able to find the speed of A, the faster one, by taking the speed of B, the slower one, and multiplying by a ratio of teeth. And by inspection, you would decide which to put at the top, which to put at the bottom. Okay, so now with that in mind, let's go back to the actual device here, which is a winch that involves a series of gears driving it. Now the way this particular winch works is we have a handle over here which is operated by a human. There's a radius of 375 and the human would rotate this handle, thereby rotating this shaft and thereby rotating this gear, the gear with 12 teeth on it. Now the gear with 12 teeth on it meshes with a gear directly below it with 30 teeth. And that gear with 30 teeth is connected to a shaft, which in turn is connected to another gear with 12 teeth. So because they're connected on a common shaft, this gear is rotating at exactly the same speed as that gear. Now the 12 tooth gear over here meshes with a 48 tooth gear beneath it, which is directly linked to the winch drum, onto which rope is wound and a load is lifted. Now first we need to consider the matter of gear ratio, which I've abbreviated as GR. Now gear ratio is multiplied when you have gears, compound gear boxes like this. Because let's go through it. This, this gear here is turning the fastest of the lot. It's linked to this gear, which now turns more slowly because it's the bigger of that pair. And then that slower speed is the same as this one. And then the speed is further slowed by a 12 to 48 tooth ratio. So what happens in total between the speed of this shaft and the speed of this winch drum is you have a ratio multiplied by a ratio. Note the word multiplied, you do not add, you multiply this ratio with this ratio to get the total gear ratio. Don't make that mistake. So total gear ratio is 48 over 12, which is this pair's ratio multiplied by 30 over 12, which is that pairs ratio, which comes to a total ratio of 10 or 10 to 1 if you prefer. What that means in simple terms is for this drum to rotate one full turn, this shaft and hence this handle must rotate 10 turns. So now to consider the total velocity ratio of the entire machine, we consider an event. Now one revolution of the drum would be convenient. Now, in one revolution of the drum, velocity ratio can be worked out by taking the distance moved by the effort and dividing into it the distance moved by the load. So the load moves one circumference, pi d. We'll talk about d in a moment, but that's the effective diameter of the winch drum. And at the top we have 2 pi r, which is the circumference of one turn of the handle but remember it turns 10 turns during this event and we would then have a velocity ratio of 31.25 let's look quickly at where the 240 millimeters or 0.24 meters came from that is known as the effective diameter of the drum the drum itself is 215 millimeters but we add 25 to get to 240 millimeters effective diameter. Now the reason why the effective diameter is greater than the drum diameter is as follows. I've drawn in an exaggerated rope diameter and the rope is depicted by the red lines over here. So here's the rope wound onto the drum. The drum is here. So we have drum diameter and then we have a green chain dot line, which is the center line of the rope. Now, for purposes of calculation of circumference and rope speed, etc., we need to work with the center line of the rope, not the outside of the drum. So between this point and this point, we have half rope diameter. And between this point and this point, we have another half rope diameter. And the effective diameter we need to take from here, the green chain dot circle, we need to take its diameter. That's diameter effective. 
Okay, so diameter effective is equal to diameter drum here to here plus diameter of rope because you have half on this side, another half on that other side, which comes to a full rope diameter. So here is a formula to remember. When you have significant rope diameter on a winch drum such as this, the effective diameter is the drum diameter plus the rope diameter. And that is how we got to that number over there of 240 millimeters. And hence to the velocity ratio of 31.25. Okay, what have we got to work out? We've got to find the efficiency. Let's read what the question says. The velocity ratio of the winch. Well, first we had to find that out. We came to 31.25, and it looks to be answer D. And then it is found that an effort of 250 newtons applied to the crank handle can just lift the load W of mass 500 kilograms. The efficiency is. So we must find the efficiency, but to do that we'll first need the mechanical advantage which by now we know is load over effort. Now if you're lifting a 500 kilogram mass, remember you've got to get that to weight, and mass times G will give you weight. So that is the load you are lifting, 500 times 9.81. You are doing it with an effort of only 250 newtons, so you are achieving a 19.62 mechanical advantage. But remember in the perfect world we would have 31.25 because MA is less than VR because of, you may recall, friction. So how efficient is the machine? MA over VR, 0.6278 or 62.8%, which happened to be question 6B. Right, here is an example for you to practice exactly what we just did. It's basically the same concept. Machine with a velocity ratio of 110 lifts a mass of 200 kilograms with an effort of 50 newtons and a load of 500 kilograms with an effort of 80 newtons. So it looks like you're only getting two sets of data points. You must find the law and you must also then calculate what effort would be required to lift a mass of 335 kilograms. Okay, so once again, stop the video here and make a good attempt at that before looking at the solution. Now lifting machines are not limited to just purely mechanical devices with linkages and gears, etc. You can also have hydraulic devices. So the next up is the hydraulic jack. Now I would strongly recommend you go and watch this little clip first. You can go to the notes to find the link to click on. So have a look at that. Stop the video and go and watch that so long and then we'll attempt this problem. Here is the problem. They say a hydraulic lifting device, a jack, consists of small and large pistons, diameters 12 and 75 millimeters. Effort is applied to the small piston, which would always be the case, and the larger piston lifts the load. Beneath both pistons is hydraulic oil connected via a pipe, as shown. If, when lifting a load of 8 metric tons, that's 8,000 kilograms by the way, the efficiency of the lifting machine is 82%, calculate the required effort. Okay, so the arrangement would look something like that. We have a piston circular in a close fitting cylinder. Then a larger piston also fitting in a round cylinder. And then we have hydraulic oil beneath the one piston and the same body of hydraulic oil under the large piston and the two are connected via a pipe. And we apply the effort, you'll see the double arrowheads indicating compressive force on the top of the small piston. And then we pack a load on the top here and we use the large piston to lift that heavy load. And then we cast our minds back to school days where we learnt that pressure is load over area, which obviously applies in this case. We have a certain load pressing down on this piston and that piston is pressing down on the oil the surface area of contact being that of a circle. Pi over 4 d squared is the preferred formula for working out area of a circle in engineering. So there it is, pi over 4 d squared, which is the area of contact beneath the piston. 
and the load resting upon it is 8,000 kilograms times 9.81 to get to weight and we find that the pressure just below this piston must be 17.764 megapascals. Let's digress for a moment and just discuss why we prefer using pi over 4 d squared rather than pi r squared for the area of a circle in engineering and that's primarily because of the fact that when we measure round objects in engineering it's infinitely easier to measure to the outside of let's say a shaft or a pipe using a vernier or other device. Measuring radius of something like a shaft would be incredibly difficult because you can't get inside the shaft, it's solid to measure the radius. So therefore we take the pi r squared formula that you're familiar with, namely area of a circle, and we replace r with d over 2 because we know after all that r is half, radius is half of diameter, and we end up with pi over 4 d squared as the preferred formula for area of a circle from here on. Let's digress a little bit further and just talk about how you easily calculate such a typical calculation using your calculator. And of course the ENG button which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But let's just do this little calculation. So get your calculator. In my case I'm using a simple FX82 Casio calculator. And I'm going to start by doing the bottom, the denominator, I'm going to say 0 0.075 squared equals multiplied by shift pi equals divide by 4 equals. So there in front of me is the answer for the denominator. Now I take the numerator 8000 times 9.81 and I simply say divide by answer ANS that bottom button near the bottom corner of right corner of your calculator divide by answer equals and now it gives me an answer 17 7, 6, 4, 2, 3, 8, 1, 3. now that's a big number to deal with and here comes the most important button of all look for the ENG button and press it okay immediately it says 17.764 times 10 to the 6 and the reason it says ENG that is the engineering button now in engineering we often use kilo mega etc uh, in this case times 10 to the 6 is mega so by pressing ENG once it's presented me the answer in a format that is useful in engineering namely 17.764 times 10 to the 6 of the base unit pascals so I can then immediately just write it as 17.764 megapascals. I want you to practice that a few times until you are comfortable with the ENG button on your calculator and comfortable with doing all of this in one step. Remember to use your answer button as well. So go through that a few times until you're comfortable. Okay, so let's carry on with the problem. There's the pressure that we spoke of, 17.764, 10 to the 6 pascals, and that is present everywhere in this oil. So on the left-hand side, the effort, which of course is the force on the small piston, divided by the area of the small piston, using pi over 4 d squared once again, works out to an effort of 2009 newtons to keep the system in balance. However, we did learn that the system is only 82% efficient and that would be because of losses in the system, perhaps friction in the walls of the pistons, perhaps friction between the oil and the walls of the pipe. Either way, we've got to allow for this inefficiency. And to do that, we have to increase the 2009 and we have to use the number 0.82. And the way to make 2009 bigger with 0.82 is not multiply, but divide. So 2009 divided by 0.82 gives you 2450 newtons required on the small piston to lift the required load. Right, here is a problem to revise the gear ratio matter that we did two problems back. It says the winch depicted below is used to raise loads on a building site. Calculate neglecting losses, the velocity ratio of the machine, 
The torque required on the winch drum when the load is 145 kilograms and it is 34 meters below the winch drum. And then the force required on the crank handle when the load is 145 kilograms and it is 34 meters below the winch drum. So there is the system depicted. It's very similar to the one we did previously. We have a crank handle, we know the radius. We know the number of teeth on the various gears. We know to take this ratio and multiply it by this ratio to get total gear ratio, that's fine. We also know how to deal with rope diameter to get effective rope diameter. All of that is good. But here's what we haven't done before. The rope mass is given per meter at 1.8 kilograms. Now that might not be significant when you are lifting a short distance. But in this case, we have 34 meters of rope hanging beneath the winch drum. So that will have some weight and that must be accounted for. First, we must find the velocity ratio of the machine. So let's do that. Gear ratio of that pair is 2, 40 over 20. Gear ratio of that pair is also 2, 40 over 20 again. So total gear ratio is the one multiplied by the other. So 4 is the total gear ratio. Then we consider one revolution of the drum, that's the event. And during that event, the load will rise one circumference, pi times 0.42. Have a look where the 0.42 comes from. Drum diameter plus rope diameter will give you effective diameter of 0.42. We just did that a short while ago. And during that time, the effort will move four turns and each turn being 2 pi r. Remember the crank handle is 0.375 radius. So the total velocity ratio of the entire machine is 7.14. Now for the first time we are seeing this word torque. They say in B you must find the torque required on the winch drum when the load is 145 kilograms and it is 34 meters below the winch drum. So let's see what happens there. Let's start by working out how tight the rope is under those conditions. We have 145 kilograms of load. We must multiply by 9.81 because mass times g gives us weight. So the weight of the load is 145 times 9.81. So right here the tension in the string or the rope is that much. But there's 34 meters of rope and the rope has a mass of 1.8 kilograms for every meter. Multiply that by 9.81 to get the weight per meter. And of course times the 34 would give us the total weight of all the rope hanging beneath the winch drum. So we've got to add the two together to get the tension over here where the string meets the drum. So the tension here is greater than the tension here. In fact it gets more and more and more as you go up because of the weight of the rope itself. Okay, so the tension up here where the rope meets the drum is 2022.82 newtons. Now if you have a winch drum depicted by this circle and you have a rope wound around it and you turn the winch drum anti-clockwise, I think you would agree that you would wind the rope up onto the drum. And to achieve that, if there's any significant tension in the rope, now tension is shown by arrowheads towards each other. In this case it was 2022.82 newtons. That is how tight the rope was. Arrowheads towards each other depicting tension, by the way. Okay, so we've got to overcome that 2022 newtons of force. And we've got to do it by turning this winch drum anti-clockwise. So let's pretend there's a shaft sticking out of the winch drum. And we've got our hand on that shaft and we are twisting it. We can all picture twisting action, I hope. We've grabbed the shaft with both our hands and we are twisting it until we get this lot to move. If we achieve it and we apply enough what is known as torque, T-O-R-Q-U-E, in an anti-clockwise direction, we will get the winch drum to just start to turn and start to wind up the rope with a tension of 2022. So torque in our case would be the force in the rope or the tension if you prefer multiplied by the radius. OK, 
Okay, so torque will be tension or force times radius in our case. Our effective radius is half of the effective diameter. Remember the effective diameter was 0.42, so it's 0.42 over 2. And we now have torque at 424.79. And note the units, please. Newton dot meter. Newton meters, the product of force and distance, gives you torque. So those units for torque are Newton meters. Lastly, the force required on the crank handle when the load is 145 kilograms and it is 34 meters below the winch drum. In other words, exactly the same conditions as before. What force do we need on the crank handle? Well, hopefully it's going to be a much smaller force than the tension in the rope because after all, this is a lifting machine where we want to achieve a big force with a small force, a small effort. So we will have to apply the velocity ratio of the machine. Or we can simply work with torques because we already know the torque over here. We've worked out what torque is required on the winch drum and remember that this gear ratio is 4 to 1 and it is speed reducing which means that there is less torque required here than there is here to the tune of four times less. So we can simply take the torque that we worked out previously, 4 to 4, divide it by 4, and we can deduce that we only need 106 Newton meters of torque at the, at the crank handle. What force must we apply on the end of the lever to achieve that torque? Well, in exactly the same way as before, torque is force times radius, so force is torque over radius. There is the radius of the, of the handle. So we as the human operator only need to in, exert 283 newtons of force here on the crank handle to make all of this happen and lift that load. And remember, we are not considering friction here. They said it was a frictionless system for the sake of this example. Right, the next bit of work is to use your textbook, which you will find on the Moodle site and attempt at least questions one, two, and three on your own. They are very simple and they reinforce what we've learned already. So once again, stop the video now, do one, two, and three at least, and then only then look at these solutions over here. Followed by four, five, six, 10, 14, and 15. And all of those concepts have been covered in the video up till now so you should have no problem doing any of those problems so stop the video and look at the solutions only once you've attempted them